Is that, and please join us. Um, if you notice, we have Lake County, Volusia County, Osceola County, Orange County, all represented here. It's, it's how this should be. Everyone embracing the opportunities to bring about positive changes, but doing so in collaboration with our citizens. That is the key. Someone said it best uh, many, many years ago to me. It was a, a pastor in one of our communities. And he says, you know, uh, if law enforcement would be more inclined to listen to what the community is asking of law enforcement versus the law enforcement community coming over to the community and saying, this is what we're going to do for you, we would have a better path uh, to reaching what we all want, which is a safe and better community for all. With that said, I'll turn it over to Ms. Paul Hosington. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you all for coming out to hear us discuss the task force and the work of the task force. My name is Paula Hoisington, and I have the pleasure of serving as the chairwoman for the Central Florida Urban League. When I was asked to be on this committee by my chief, Chief Broadway, out of Claremont, Florida, I thought, is this just going to be another committee to where we just sit back and listen? Or will there be voices heard, decisions made, and compromise? And from the start, from day one, I can truly say that every member of law enforcement was willing and waiting to hear the voice of the community, understanding that, as Dr. Nelson always says, it's not this or that, it's this and that. Understanding that we all want to live in a safe community. Everyone wants to live, work, and play safe, right? And every law enforcement that suits up every morning wants to go home to their family. So how do we do that? We begin with conversations, those intentional conversations, the necessary conversations, the conversations to listen to what both sides have to say. Because I can truly say going in, it was the community knows, and we're tired of them coming in telling us what works best for our community. And then the law enforcement are saying, we patrol the streets. We know what needs to happen in your community. But what this task force did was listen to each other discuss the issues and recognize that everyone wants to be on the same playing field. And this is a roadmap. It's not the answer to everything, but it's a roadmap for us, as I said, to begin to have those necessary conversations. How do we begin? Identifying, working together, understanding the backstories of the communities, and taking time to not just want to implement, but to care, to get to the root of the cause and find solutions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Nelson um, to continue talking about the community aspect, and then we'll hear from some of our chiefs that participated in. And again, thank you for being here for this important occasion. Good morning, good morning. Uh, Randy Nelson, Thune Cook University, Center for Law and Social Justice. Uh, when Chief Rallone invited me to be a member of the subcommittee, I've had worked with Cecil, uh, Chief Smith before on some community engagement. So this work is not new, so we've been doing this work. I think the difference with this work at this time, although we had had previous conversations about engaging the community, why the community, policing isn't something you do to a community, it's something you do with the community. We've always had that. But I think George Floyd sparked a conversation, not only a conversation in Florida, but around the, around the globe. And it was a conversation about what do we expect within the field of policing. And policing, as Paula said, is not this or that. I would be lying to you if I were to tell you that there aren't individuals within the law enforcement professional that are not worthy of the calling and the high honor of that. I would, be, I would be lying to you. I would be lying to you if I told you there were not professors or doc They're all, every profession that you know had. The difference in law enforcement is that they're given a gun and a badge. And they should be held to a higher standard. Can't be the Jesus Christ standard, but damn well they should be held to a higher standard. What I like about the Florida Police Chiefs Association and the individuals on this stage is that they're willing to do some introspection. What, what is it can we do to be better? We have Chief 
Young from Daytona Beach, month to month, he lost an officer, an officer that was senseless. And he's standing on this stage saying, what can we do better? Chief Rallone, he allowed individuals to come outside of his department to come in and do a, a full-fledged review of his department. You've heard folk criticize him for sitting down at the table to have conversations, both internal and external. It takes courageous leadership. That's what, that's what gives me hope now. The individual on this stage is about courageous leadership. Now on the flip side of that, here in Orlando, I was in Little Rock, Arkansas two months ago. A two-year-old was killed in a drive-by shooting. We've had young folk right here in the city of Orlando. That even if I were to get rid of every racist police officer, every violent police officer that does not live up to, even if I were to get rid of them, the violence and killing in some of our communities would still be there. So accountability has to go both ways. I, I'm 100% holding law enforcement accountable. But I'm also 100% that a mother in Paramore or a mother on Mercy Drive don't have to worry about her son or daughter being killed in the street. I'm just concerned about that. And that's what I think this body of work is. It's not just what can police officers do better? What can the law enforcement profession do better? It's also about what role that the community has in ensuring the safety and well-being of their community. So as Paula said, this is a, a road map. This may not work in every city or every community, but what does work in every city and every community is policing with the community. And thank you for your time and attention to this, this event. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Before I turn it over to uh, Chief Smith, the Florida Police Chiefs Association, I have to applaud them for taking the initiative to put this subcommittee together that was led by Chief uh, Holloway in St. Petersburg. And he was also named the Police Chief of the Year for the Florida Police Chiefs Association. So that's the type of leadership that was at this table. There are many people that I look up to when it comes to our profession. One of those is here, Chief Cecil Smith, who will be next. Well, good morning, everyone. Chief Smith, Sanford Police Department. You know, it's, uh, it was a pleasure and an opportunity for us as chiefs to sit with stakeholders from across our state to have very in-depth, sometimes very hard conversations. But in those conversations, we were able to look at recommendations that will help not only the police department, but our community. I kind of look at it in this sense is that public safety is everyone's responsibility. Let me say that again. Public safety is everyone's responsibility, not just the police department, not just the pastors, not just the teachers, not the doctors, the lawyers, and sometimes the Indian chief. It is all of our responsibility to make sure that our community is safe, all of our communities. And this was an opportunity for us to sit down and have very straightforward conversations about the things that are taking place in our community. As was said before, George Floyd struck a nerve in law enforcement in our communities across the country, and in many cases around the world. And what that did for us, it made us look, take an opportunity to reflect on who we are and what we were doing. How were we communicating and treating each other? What were we doing to try to resolve the issues that are affecting the people in our communities every single day. Now, I, I have to tell you, you know, it was, it was a great pleasure to have that opportunity to sit and talk. Even though we had to do it over Zoom, and we had many, many, many Zoom meetings with each other, but the thing was this, we had open and honest conversations. We looked back at, initially at the uh, Eight Can't Wait. That was our first initiative. You know, looking at accountability for our officers. And then we looked at the 21st century policing concepts that started back in 2015. Our goal was to take a second look at that and see how those uh, recommendations, that foundation, those footprints then, how were they affecting us and were we able to do our jobs now and could we do it more effectively? How to have you know, our local stakeholders give us insight once they had an opportunity to actively see 
what was said back in 2015, and then challenge us as law enforcement leaders to make a determination, what are we doing, and how can they, our community, help us do it better? So it was an extreme pleasure to do it, and you know, again, this is just, these are just recommendations. These are things that we have had an opportunity to look at, some of the things many of our agencies are already doing, some of the things some of our agencies will begin in the future. But these are just recommendations so that people at least have a, you know, a, a blueprint to move forward and to move forward with the community, to work with the community, work in the community to make all of our communities better. Thank you. Chief Broadway could not make it, but we have a captain here who would like to speak on his behalf. Hey, good morning. I'm Captain Michael McMaster of the Claremont Police Department. I'm here to make a few remarks on behalf of Chief Charles Broadway. He apologizes for not being here this morning. This is due to several schedule conflicts that arose this morning. First, Chief Broadway wanted to thank the Florida Police Chiefs Association for appointing him to serve on the subcommittee for accountability and societal change. He thanks all the law enforcement executives for their collaboration and recommendations to lead the way to better serve our community while reducing crime. Chief Broadway also wanted to thank the members of the community who provided valuable input and recommendations. He specifically wanted to thank Ms. Paula Hoisington, a longtime resident of Claremont, for her valuable feedback. He goes on to say at times, though, we did not agree on everything, but what was very inspiring is that several ideas for our community partners were not only on how law enforcement could improve, but they had to also take a hard look at areas where the community could do better in supporting and working with their local law enforcement agencies. Chief Broadway believes that the recommendations made in this use of force report, as well as the pillars of change report, is the model and the standard to achieve and maintain excellence in today's policing. Chief Broadway strongly believes that the recommendations listed in both reports will build trust within our respective communities, build strong bonds, open doors for healthy dialogue, and together and collectively prevent and reduce crime in our communities. The police are the community, and the community are the police. Again, on behalf of Chief Broadway, thank you. Thank you. And someone who's no stranger to the Orlando Police Department, Chief Pete Gauntlet, who now leads the St. Cloud Police Department has taken that agency to the next level. Chief. Thank you, Chief. Um, just a few comments, but it's nice to kind of come back. You know, I've, I've had the pleasure of being in this business now 40, almost 41 years, and, and certainly our commitment to the community in St. Cloud um, is just as strong there as it is here and in some of our peer communities throughout Central Florida. When you think about public safety, you have to think it is the foundation of every community. It's the responsibility of every community to reach out. The one thing that I will emphasize is assertive and aggressive communication between our public safety partners and our community stakeholders. The focus in every community has to be the well-being of all of its residents and the consistency within the agencies has to be the foundation. Our ability to, to develop progressive policies, to train our staff, and to be responsive is critical. In an age of social media and the outcry, and oftentimes the inconsistency of social media and how we have to deal with that on a daily basis. No community is immune from the challenges that go forward, but every community must work together with their citizens to ensure that their voice is heard in the community and that law enforcement not only responds, but the community then respects the fact that the agency itself is engaged and committed to providing that level of public safety, which is so critical for every community. And Chief Rulon, thank you again for having me today. Thank you, Chief. So the law enforcement profession has lost 25,000 members um, in our history, right? And one of those losses was suffered here recently in Daytona. Chief Young is here joining us today. Thank you, Chief Rulon. Uh, Jakara Young, Chief of Police, uh, Daytona Beach Police Department. Um, I just needed to be here this morning to show my support to uh, the Florida Police Chiefs Association and all the members up here of the subcommittee uh, that put together this brilliant document. Um, truly, where we're at right now in law enforcement, this document is just, in my opinion, it's just vital to us as law enforcement leaders. 
because when I read over that document and it focuses on the sanctity of human life, I mean, that is literally where we're at right now to where all of our policies and our procedures, if that is not the center focus of our policies and procedures, then we are doing something wrong. So I just really wanted to be here today just to lend my support to the subcommittee and to the document itself because obviously I didn't get a chance to be a part of that subcommittee, but then when I saw uh, the finished product of it, I, I had to be here today uh, just to show my support because I'm a firm believer that in law enforcement, you know, we're given a certain level of authority, we're given guns, we're given badges, but the one thing that I've been preaching since becoming the chief is at our core, we are nothing more than public servants. So it's just that, just ingraining that into law enforcement, especially when we, when we talk about 21st century policing, I think it all centers around that. Uh, one of the other chiefs already referenced uh, Sir Robert Peel being the modern day founder of law enforcement where he, where he says the community are the police and the police are the community. So in all we do, we have to realize that we have to partner with the community and without that partnership with the community, you know, all of our efforts are going to be highly ineffective and highly divisive and again, I just want to be here today to show my support and thank all of the uh, subcommittee members for their work. And we also have representation from the Lake County Sheriff's Office. Would you like to speak? Good morning. Uh, my name is Fred Jones. I'm a lieutenant with the Lake County Sheriff's Office. Um, one of my job duties there is a uh, PIO. I'm also in professional standards, which deals with internal affairs. And so sometimes those officers sit across from me. Back in 2016, I went to a training, and it was called uh, uh, Right Training, and it dealt with emotional intelligence. And we adopted that. And why I think this is so important is because it starts with the officers. For 24 years, I've been in this business, and we've always learned how to treat other people, which I think is very important. But we've never been told how to treat ourselves. And what this emotional intelligence class does, what it's done for our officers, is realize that you know, hurt people hurt people. So we talk about self-awareness, we talk about empathy, we talk about social intelligence, or emotional intelligence plus social intelligence equals racial intelligence. That means you're gonna treat everybody equal. And so I've taught this within other agencies within my county, as well as Osceola County, and um, I encourage just every agency to teach their officers how to be good to themselves how to take care of themselves, how to seek help. So when I heard that there was an opportunity to come and listen to um, agencies talk about doing better, I definitely want to be a part of it, so thank you. Thank you. So before we turn it over to question, uh, your questions, just want to share uh, part of my experience with, with this great, great group. You know, so law enforcement officers are usually really guarded when they go into a new environment. They study the environment before they speak, before they say anything. The community members, they came in right away providing question or suggestions and questions. It was such a learning experience. No one was shy about, eventually, no one was shy about speaking up uh, for anything that they feel strongly about. And it also allowed for that conversation to be a two-way discussion. I think that was the most rewarding part about this entire process, that no one held back. Everyone was very uh, uh, focused and making sure that everyone in the room or during the meetings understood what was being discussed and took every recommendation to heart. So with that said, we'll turn it over to you now for any questions you may have uh, from our panels. Anyone specific? And to whom? I think most of the questions will come to you too anyway, so. <laughs> if I understood you um, correctly, you said the most... The most, the most common pain point between the communities and police relations. Transparency. Transparency. A lot of the community members wanted to ensure that when they are interacting with law enforcement, that there was transparency, that there was truth, that they were given the information of what occurred in a timely manner. Before, before it got like that, that teapot, 
you know, it keeps bubbling up until it finally explodes. So they wanted to know when the procedures, policies allowed information to be shared with the community that law enforcement do just that, share it with the community. I'll take us down with that. So one of, the, uh, one of the recommendations from the Bowman Group uh, that they made was that we actually follow just what you said. Take a little time to add a few extra seconds to explain the situation to that person that you're, that you're stopping. There's seven, eight uh, things that you can do during a vehicle stop. But I also think that uh, society needs to be reminded that when there is a vehicle stop taking place, it's not the time to get argumentative, it's not the time to fight, you know, uh, and, and, and be very, we shouldn't get into a confrontation during that process. Allow the process to take place. Allow for the officer to follow what they're supposed to do, but also for the officers to take a few extra seconds to explain Sir, ma'am, the reason why I'm stopping you is because you have a broken tail light, or you ran that stop sign, or you ran that light. Take the extra seconds to explain, explain to that individual what is going on so that you can then put them at ease, at least try to put them at ease. But that is one of the recommendations that this report and other reports are making these days that for officers to use uh, different techniques when it comes to encounters with our citizens and even tracking the encounter with whom you have that encounter. For example, you know, in our case, in our department, it's easy to capture who the driver was, you know, and what happened during a vehicle stop, but we also found that we were not collecting enough data to show who exactly was the passenger in the back seat, you know, what was their, their race or sex, stuff like that. We're not, those are areas that we can improve upon, so. So in Central Florida, I think we're very proud that all of us uh, have placed a lot of importance on the level of training that our officers receive. I would venture to say that we probably lead in most parts of the state when it comes to that type of training. So this report is, is, was made or the recommendations were made in general terms so that anyone who may be lacking in those areas can make, take note of that and apply that type of training uh, where it's missing. We don't think, uh, to be honest with you, there's always room for improvement. There's always ways that you can improve how you train your officer, especially in those high risk situations. We're always looking at best practices. We consider all of our policies to be live documents that are constantly changing. Even from, from we were just reaccredited, using Orlando as an example, with flying colors. But the Bowman Group found that some of our policy, including our use of force policy, could use some uh, adjustments, right? So again, we're open to the idea of making those adjustments as needed, but we need to identify what those adjustments are. Using our Citizens Police Review Board to provide feedback in that process, soliciting feedback from our citizens when we are adjusting our, our policies is very important, but you have to have someone with the level of knowledge that can provide you with that feedback that is appropriate and accurate in order for you to affect those changes. So short answer to you, we're already doing a lot to address those issues. These recommendations are for maybe some areas where that is not taking place. This could be for Curtis McLeod with Section News 13, could be for either, either of the chiefs. I know that in the report you guys mentioned uh, trying to foster a more diverse workforce. What's being done to ensure that you guys have officers that are more reflective of the communities that you we take him from from Sam. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. And he's not joking either. I think I've lost five in the past two years to him. So, you know, one of the big things is is you know looking at our cadet program. 
going out into the communities, working with uh, you know, our churches, working with our schools. I mean, Bethune is, is a great example. You know, getting into those organizations to try and start the conversations early. You know, doing sponsorships, because one of the things that many agencies, I want to say, tend to run into is people who can't afford to go to the academy. So hiring people before they go to the academy, giving them a job in a position prior, so once they're done with the academy, that they have an opportunity to come onto the agency. Recruiting from our explorer programs, recruiting from our volunteer programs, all of those are, are you know, avenues for us to bring people of a diverse community into the policing uh, agencies. So, I mean, the good thing is a lot of the recommendations are already in place. So we didn't look at this just from the individuals who had a seat at the table. We looked at it as how holistically in the state of Florida, as part of the FBCA's uh, process, how we could make these recommendations for others in all, all over the state. Here's the issue, though. I think that consistency when it comes to how law enforcement delivers services from county to county, from city to city, from state to state is different. We have got to come up with a better way to have the same process be the same throughout. It's easier said than done, but that is one of the things that we're finding when it comes to the law enforcement profession. Everyone has a different way of doing business, and we need to come up. Canada, what is Canada doing? They're consolidating as many agencies as they can. They're reducing uh, the number of agencies. They're creating bigger agencies so they can have consistent tr training across the board. Maybe that is something that we need to explore in the United States uh, in our way of doing business. Um, go ahead. Everyone has a responsibility, we believe, to take this report, and their communities also have a responsibility to ensuring that, in my opinion, if this is what they want for their law enforcement agencies to reflect, that they demand that from their law enforcement agencies. I think, though, uh, to give credit uh, to the law enforcement profession in, in Florida, everyone I think is doing their best to try to implement these type of um, recommendations. But I think it's also part of, like it was mentioned here, the community has to play a role to work with law enforcement. Law enforcement has to work with the community to ensure that whatever's being delivered in those communities is in keeping with what the community expects and the recommendations, of course, that are being made. They're recommendations, they're not mandates but we believe this will serve better for all of us. Just to piggyback on something that uh, Chief Rolone was kind of alluding to, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who is the undersheriff in uh, Winnebago County in Illinois, suburban Chicago, who is reviewing our recommendations. So Florida tends to lead the country in many of the things that we do, many of the law enforcement activities that are taking place. So when you start getting you know, phone calls from people outside of this area, not just central Florida, but out of state, who are taking uh, an opportunity to review the report, looking at ways that they could put those recommendations in place as well. See, things tend to uh, lead to uh, uh, us doing some great work with our stakeholders and making those recommendations. As we said before, these are just recommendations. People can choose to use them, they can choose not to. But our goal is to make sure that we are all on the same even playing field, that we can all speak the same language, that we're looking at the same training, so that we have that universal opportunity to make sure that we're serving in the communities and bringing forth you know, good service and partnershipping. I was gonna say, I think it'd probably be good if based on your question, Dr. Nelson expands on what uh, the community believes law enforcement should be doing to draw more people uh, that is a reflection of the community into the law enforcement profession and as part of Bethune-Cookman what they're doing to try to encourage that. Thank you. Yeah, at Bethune-Cookman University we're very intentional. Uh, we've probably had more students going to law enforcement in the last five years than we've had in previous because it's an intentional two ways. So we have an actual simulator at the university. There's probably no other school in the state of Florida or the country that's not an academy that actually have a simulator. So our students, not just criminal justice major, our students can go in the simulator, shoot, don't shoot, shoot scenarios like she mentioned. 
So I, I think some of that, and some of it is exposure. So many of our students probably have had bad experiences with law enforcement in their home community. And on the flip side of that, most of the students that want to go into law enforcement, they say because they've had a good experience with someone. But I think particularly our HBCUs here in Florida, we're more intentional because either you be the change you want to see or you sit on the, uh, on the sideline and say, this should change. So, and, and we're not trying to change to, to create the next police officer. At Bethune Cookman University, we're, we're producing the, the next Chief Youngs. I, 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 is, I have no, I, no desire to create a police officer. What we want to produce is individuals with the character and the courage to change and be a part of the change of leading law enforcement. So, you know, you need to plant your seeds early, right? So we started a new junior reserve law enforcement program similar to the ROTC concept at Jones High School in Lake Nona. 90 kids at Jones High School, 180 kids at Lake Nona, and hopefully some of those kids will follow a path into the profession. But we have to work on that early so that we can produce those potential candidates in the future. So. Well, one of the things we had is our CNI group, which is the Community Neighborhood Initiatives. Uh, that group uh, kind of formed out of looking at bringing new homes and new housing into the community, and now it has warped into a partnership for, for community folks to come in if they have issues, kind of that bridging, if there's a concern, that group of individuals have that ability to c literally connect directly with me, actually through my deputy chief, because he sits on that committee. So when there's issues and concerns that are there, we continue to have those. You know, some of you who have been here have known me for the past eight years as chief. We are in the community even during COVID, knocking on doors, talking to people, helping people out, continuing to have those conversations, you know, on the grassroots ground level. You know, one of the things that I, I think is extremely exciting is that we have the Urban League that is coming into the community as well. And I'm meeting with Glenn on Thursday morning to see how we can connect with the Urban League from Orlando to come into Sanford to see how we can continue that conversation. What are the things we can do? Can we find new jobs for people in the underprivileged areas? Uh, how do we bring food into the underprivileged areas through you know, harvest time? So we, we've done a number of things within the community to try to bridge that gap. As I explained before, you know, through our explorers programs, through our cadet program, integrating our department. You know, we, we talk about uh, cultural competency. You, know, you can't have that unless you understand the people that you're dealing with and have an understanding for the people who are in the community speaking the same language for everyone that's in the community as a whole. So as far as Daytona Beach, um, first off, I would have to uh, respectfully disagree with the statement that led to the question. I know you may have covered maybe a couple stories in Daytona where uh, race was brought into it as a factor that led to whatever the story was. But as the police chief, I can tell you, I believe we have a very good relationship with the overwhelming majority of the minority community in my city. And I think that was on showcase after the incident that happened with Officer Rayner. You're always going to have those that are on social media, trolls on social media, that's going to put negative out there. But the overwhelming majority of support um, that we received and that I received specifically from the community was just that. It was overwhelming. So um, I think the reason that that is is because we're doing the best we can to, you know, bridge that gap. We're out there in the community, one of the first initiatives, and I, I believe I probably stole it from, from Chief Cecil from uh, the Park Walk and Talk, when we're just out there in the community for no reason. Like, we don't want to be seen just when there is an incident. If we're seen just when there is an incident, then that's a fail on our part. We have to be out there when there's nothing going on. And that's where we create that level of comfort between the police in the community just by being seen. So it's twofold. We're engaging in the community and we're also deterring crime because those that would be in the area um, to up to no good, they're less likely to do anything when they see us. 
but we're not necessarily out there being heavy handed with enforcement. And I've gotten nothing but compliments over the last nine months of, you know, keep going, Chief. You're doing a good job. Even though we had this unfortunate incident, we're seeing the difference. We're seeing the change. So we're just going to continue. We're consistently training on de-escalation and a lot of that can occur just in a briefing because I'm one that I believe that de-escalation starts at initial contact. It starts with what comes out of the officer's mouth regardless of what the, what the situation or the circumstance is. It's just my belief that de-escalation starts at initial contact. So short answer is yes, we're going to continue to train on it. I mean, we've seen things come about, you know, after George Floyd, as far as um, um, the officer's duty to intervene, for instance, all of that is considered de-escalation. When you see one officer getting a little agitated, it's incumbent upon the backup officer to step in and pull an officer back so that it doesn't escalate into something that's going to shed a negative light on law enforcement as a whole because we realize now no matter where the incident happens, it affects all of us. It affects all of us all over this country whenever you have an incident of, of excessive force. Chief Young, you spoke a little bit about those outreach efforts that police officers are doing across you know, your jurisdiction as well as the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of elaborate on what's being done now you know, that may not, have been being, may, may not have been done prior to the George Floyd situation as far as outreach? Well, again, I don't think we're doing anything that hasn't been done before. We're definitely not out here reinventing the wheel. It's just all about being approachable. It's all about being seen. It's all about getting away from driving through neighborhoods with windows up. We know it's Florida. We know it's hot. But at the same time, I think that's where we miss the mark, to where we're sitting in patrol cars and we're just zooming by kids, elderly folks, young folks that, you know, may be leery of us. We, we, the message now is everybody you see on the side of the road, in the store, at the bus stop, wherever they may be, that is an opportunity. That is an opportunity to change someone's viewpoint on law enforcement just because you spoke first. You know, you have to stand there and have a long conversation. But I think a lot of folks, it, it seems like they're almost surprised when the officer says, hey, how are you? How is your day? Simple things like that. It's just the basic concept of treating everybody like you would want your mother, father, grandmother, brother, sister to be treated if they were approached by law enforcement. So I, don't, I can't stand up here and tell you we have some brilliant plan in place that's going to bridge the gap. It's just doing just the basic, courteous, common sense things to show that regardless of the uniform, we're human beings. We're human beings. So our expectation is from the law enforcement personnel as far as leaders, actually the law enforcement profession as a whole, our expectation is that our officers, anyone who has the honor of having this job, to always treat people with dignity and respect regardless of who's watching or what is capturing that uh, interaction. So take for example the Orlando Police Department, about 300,000 contacts per year with citizens. The overwhelming majority of those are always in a positive, with a positive outcome, right? But we do have to address and we have to do our best to make sure that those negative contacts, if they're there, that they're reduced or eliminated completely. It's a reinforcement effort that we have to exercise with our, with our officers to constantly remind them of that. What was set up here, take the extra time 
to treat people or give people a little bit of extra time to understand what is going on. We are dealing, we have, unfortunately for the law enforcement profession, we are probably always put in a situation where we're dealing with the worst of the worst situation that anyone is experiencing in their lives at that moment when the law enforcement officer is asked to come in and try to remedy or fix the issue. It's challenging, but like they said, the expectation for you to be a law enforcement officer is high. You are held to a very high standard. That's why we go through 4,000 applications each year with about 2,000 people being afforded the opportunity to move forward with the application process. And maybe out of that, we select 100 because we're picking the best of the best. But we do come from the human race and every once in a while, we have to remind our officers there are better ways of doing business. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a work in progress, but the work will never stop. The work will never end. We have to make sure that we continue doing what we have done for years. I think the law enforcement profession today is better than the profession of 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. We constantly have to look for ways to improve it. If you will allow me, I would like for Ms. Hoisington to wrap it up and provide some closing remarks, and we'll be done. Thank you, Chief. Um, hopefully you've gotten a window, a peek inside the window, of what our intent was where we hope to go, how we plan as a community to continue to have these intentional conversations, getting the community to understand that they also have a responsibility to work with law enforcement, to continue to have those conversations, bringing in our communities to show, so that they have investment in their communities. As I said, everyone wants to live, work, and play safely. And then law enforcement is there as our partners. So thank you again. If you have any other questions, people, Free to reach out to any member of the task force and we look forward to pushing this information out as the chief said he gets a call from Chicago so just think if we can get all of our law enforcement and communities engaging in those intentional conversations what a difference it will make in our society so again thank you so much thank you We brought lunch for our guests, but I think there's going to be a little bit of extra. If you all want lunch, this lunch is there. So. <laughs> Great job. Two, right?